Okay, okay. We are uh, we are ready to go, Ashwin. And uh, nice, again, sir. thank you so much uh, for being with us. And you sort of uh, there's a wonderful streak your uh, uh, series of lectures on load transformation. It's so so beneficial for the audience. Thank you once again for your persistent effort. Yeah, Ashwin. Thank you for the opportunity, sir. Uh, welcome once again to another uh, session of the liver transplantation series of the LGS Forum. Uh, tonight we'll now uh, move on to the uh, uh, to to something more exciting for the surgeons who form the majority in this group. Now we know that uh, organ preservation is one of the most important components of liver transplantation because the efficacy of uh, preservation has an e enormous impact on outcomes. In fact, apart from maybe immunosuppression, the uh, successful evolution of organ transplantation may be attributed to the uh, development of the concept of organ preservation. Hence, an in-depth understanding of the principles of why we do, of what we do with respect to cold preservation is extremely important to understanding the whole physiology of organ transplantation itself. Another important aspect as a lead surgeon is being in the driving seat and uh, taking a call when to accept or turn down an offer. As is obvious, it is crucial to no, uh, 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 it is crucial to not only the success of, of the surgery and the recipient, but also to the center and the surgeon at the helm himself. This can be quite uh, uh, challenging, especially in the Indian scenario where these organs are hard to come by. To talk to us uh, about uh, this is our first speaker, Dr. Anand Ramurthy, who heads the liver transplant team at the Apollo Group of Hospitals. Anand did his basic and high surgical training in India, followed by fellowships in the UK. He's been part of the Apollo team for close to a decade and a half now. I know Dr. Anand, uh, before he became a hotshot transplant surgeon that he's been for over a decade. I was his uh, JR in uh, Gangaram Hospital back in 2005, where I remember him as an excellent teacher and a surgeon. Dr. Anand holds various uh, posts in international surgical and transplant bodies, including being the uh, governing council member of the Liver Transplantation Society of India. Also, the uh, uh, taking the topic further, uh, the most important part for a surgeon is the organ retrieval operation itself. An important aspect of this uh, surgery is that it should be safely performed, it should be done quickly, and the steps should be easily reproduced by any general surgeon without the need for specialized equipment. Uh, in fact, this operation should be uh, 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 should be an operation which every surgeon should learn as it provides an in-depth and practical understanding of the abdominal anatomy and steps of almost every GI operation. Also, from a training standpoint, it's the first operation which a transplant fellow learns to do independently. Operative errors can not only adverse the uh, adversely affect the transplant itself, but can sometimes affect their uh, uh, long-term uh, uh, career prospects as well, uh, uh, and and can be a part of uh, folklore and, and and usually get quoted. Uh, now, uh, here are many ways to skin the cat, but the core principles of this operation remain the same. To talk to us about all this and its pitfalls is our second speaker, Dr. Yogesh Puri. He's a transplant surgeon from Professor Ella's team. Yogesh did his surgical training in India and has spent close to a decade in the UK, having trained extensively at the Royal Free with big names like Brian Davidson and then at King's, where he has personally performed close to 500 retrievals. Apart from his astute financial equipment on which we sort of uh, keep asking him opinions on, Yogesh is a dependable surgeon with current interests on uh, uh, arteries in an LDLT graft. But uh, before that, let's hear it from Dr. Anand. Dr. Anand, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Radhakrishna. And uh, thank you, uh, Ashwin, for that wonderful introduction. So as Ashwin has pointed out, uh, I am Dr. Yogesh is going to talk about the exciting surgical aspects that are relevant for uh, all surgeons, uh, while I am going to talk about the principles and the decision making. So my talk, when I said about when he gave me uh, this talk, um, and considering the audience initially, it felt that it could be a bit uh, uh, dry uh, to uh, talk about. 
but then what i have tried to do is combine uh, different aspects and uh, uh, take out the gist of it so uh, it is going to be uh, uh, in a uh, different parts as i will come but it's very relevant considering the audience because most of you are going to be in a transplant center where you may be called upon to assist in a organ um, a retrieval surgery or uh, you may be part of a transplant team or even if you are not a part of a transplant team you may be part of a non transplant organ retrieval center where you may be called upon to either uh, uh, you know manage a donor or operate on a donor retrieval surgery so i am going to uh, do this talk in part first i will talk about uh, the donor organs now we all know that there is an in- there is demand for uh, liver far outstrips the organ supply so there has been a constant search for strategies which would enable us to improve or increase the utilization of available organs and uh, there have been previously organs that would have been considered suboptimal or marginal uh, and uh, often since this comes with a negative connotation when we go to a donor family and a recipient family and then tell them that you are going to get a marginal organ uh, it has a fairly negative connotation as you can understand so the term extended criteria donors is more appropriate for such organs the definition of extended criteria donor is not well defined or agreed upon uh because it changes the parameters change with time and from place to place and with experience there is a spectrum that changes so but what is agreed upon is that use of these extended criteria grafts confers a higher risk of uh, dysfunction such as primary non function early or late allograft dysfunction with its attendant increased morbidity and mortality but with proper growth graft and donor optimization an appropriate recipient selection the outcomes can be made similar to standard donor grafts so in this presentation i am going to talk in three aspects who is a marginal donor and what constitutes a marginal graft and how do we overcome or uh, mitigate this to improve outcomes in the recipients and finally i am going to talk about organ preservation both static and dynamic so uh, the factors that define graft quality or an extended criteria graft is one that confers a risk of impaired function in the recipient these would include donor age uh, increased fat content in the liver uh, increased cold ischemia time uh, donation after cardiac death splitting of a deceased donor graft prolonged icu stay and poor donor maintenance the other factor would be grafts that carry a risk of inherent disease transmission to the recipient this could be either hepatitis b or hepatitis c infection grafts with benign tumors donors with extra hepatic malignancies or what are termed as uh, high risk donors so let us look at some of these aspects in a little more detail now age is a relative concept there has been in early times we used to get more of uh, uh, road traffic accidents young pristine livers 22 year old uh, donor you know that the liver is going to be good uh, whatever be the insult it would probably work fine but as uh, age increases this regenerative capacity of the liver decreases the livers are more prone to ischemia reperfusion injury there is increased incidence of comorbid illnesses steatosis atherosclerosis and even occult malignancies synthetic capacity of the liver is only minimally affected due to a good reserve and a dual blood supply the risk factors when we combine age with other risk factors such as donor diabetes mellitus or increased increased risk of graft failure or if we put the graft into a sicker recipient say the melt more than 20 or hepatitis c positive recipients again the risk of graft failure increases so with careful donor and recipient selection a comparable survival can be achieved now with increasing incidence of obesity and diabetes in the population steatosis is an increasing problem steatotic grafts are less tolerant to cold ischemia they are more susceptible to ischemia reperfusion injury because the hepatic microcirculation is impaired there is disturbed disruption of the electron transport chain and decreased atp synthesis 
the cytoplasmic free fatty acids are susceptible to undergo lipoperoxidation which gives rise to increase free radicals and which damages the cellular architecture and this results in upregulation of the pro inflammatory response now extent of macrovesicular steatosis is believed to be more significant than microvesicular uh, in terms of impacting the outcome and moderate and severe uh, steatosis have been associated with lower graft and patient survival rates and increased primary non function again strategies for optimizing outcome here include optimization of other risk factors and there is a upcoming role uh, of extra corporeal machine perfusion which i will talk about in detail later third is the cold ischemia time cold ischemia time is important because this is one of the factors that can potentially be controlled now prolonged cold ischemia time by itself increases the risk of primary non function early allograft dysfunction ischemic cholangiopathy and graft loss in a large survey of about 67000 patients in the unos database now cold ischemia time is an independent risk factor for poor survival in sicker recipients with higher melt and when combined with other uh, risk factors such as donor age graft steatosis obesity or diabetes it significantly increases the risk of graft loss this is another area where there is promising results with ex vivo normothermic machine perfusion and uh, studies have uh, reported lower P, uh, enzyme uh, markers of injury and early allograft dysfunction similar biliary complications graft and patient survival as in standard uh, grafts dcd or donation after cardiac death is not yet uh, started in our country in a, but it remains on the fringes however it perf- um, comprises a quarter of all uh, deceased donor liver transplants in the uk and 5% in the us now uh, it is associated with decreased graft and patient survival increased ischemic cholangiopathy primary non function and risk of retransplantation donor warm ischemia time that is time from extubation to aortic cross clamp is an independent risk factor for graft loss and most centers would not accept an organ if this warm ischemia time exceeds 30 minutes ischemic cholangiopathy which is caused by blood stasis and clotting in the peribiliary microcirculation is one of the main cause of graft failure this is another area where uh, extra corporeal machine perfusion uh, is promise uh, has shown promising results splitting of grafts is basically done in deceased donors when uh, the left lateral segment is taken for a pediatric uh, uh, recipient and the other half, other part for an adult recipient but left and right splits can also be done they confer an increased risk because there is an increased incidence of biliary and vascular complications uh but with equivalent patient and graft survival now this difference is marked more marked with ex vivo split grafts that is when grafts are split on the back bench in the cold donor age increasing donor age prolonged cold ischemia time ex situ splitting and transplant done for urgent indications are uh, risk factors for graft failure however with careful donor and recipient selection and an in situ split these outcomes can be improved uh since in india we are very used to live donor liver transplant uh an in situ split is intuitively uh easy for us however it requires careful logistic management donor selection has to be done carefully pre operative imaging with a ct angiography as would be done for a live uh, donor should be uh, available at odd hours and uh, splitting should be done as we would do for a live donor one of the advantages is that if the donor becomes hemodynamically unstable during the splitting process or uh, is coagulopathic and cannot be corrected then they are not good candidates for splitting and it can be uh, given up uh, or aborted at that point donor maintenance is one of the crucial areas uh, in the west there are more uh, homogeneous or uniform systems and there are organ procurement organizations or opos which take care of coordinate between the donor uh, uh, hospital and the recipient uh, center or the transplant team however in india you are all aware that uh, the healthcare systems are heterogeneous the first point of uh, contact the uh, where the patient is taken to could be a nearby nursing home or a small clinic from where they are shifted the downtime the Uh, degree of resuscitation are all not controlled by us however once a potential donor is identified 
the, the protocol based management has to be initiated to maintain adequate tissue perfusion and oxygenation and the key is good communication and cooperation of the donor center uh, medical personnel with the transplant teams invasive monitoring using central venous and arterial lines to guide volume resuscitation and presidosis is very important uh, many of these patients have diabetes insipidus which causes loss of free water leading to an electrolyte imbalance especially hyponatremia which is compounded by the hypertonic saline which may be given to reduce intracranial pressure uh, if, before they are identified as donors and this should be managed with fluids and uh, desmopressin uh, nasal spray hormone replacement therapy is often not uh, recommended as mandatory in many centers but in our setting we have found it to be very useful because of the reasons i talked to uh, previously uh, and uh, steroids levothyroxine and insulin to counter the endocrine metabolic and stress response improves the number of organs used in our setup it optimizes any other factors that may be lacking in donor management even if levothyroxine uh, is not available we ask uh, the donor center or we we administer uh, thyroxine through the nasogastric tube how much it is absorbed and what is the effect is not clear but the risk benefit is uh, or very low in these patients so we give hormone replacement therapy for all patients so this is a summary of what i have talked to before what is clear is in these strategies if there is any risk factor it has to be balanced out by keeping the other factors less so more the number of risk factors that pile up more the possibility that we would have a poor outcome uh, uh, in the graft or the patient in these years for uh, just specifying for if you see that the donor age they talk about reducing the cold ischemia time to less than 8 hours steatosis again reduce cold ischemia time after cardiac death cold ischemia time needs to be reduced similarly uh, one of the other things is that when we do that in uh, uh we have to choose the donor make sure that uh, the inotrope dose is not very high similar to that so this is what balances out that score uh, the risk in the donor and again uh, to balance it out we have to be careful with the recipient selection as well as you can see that if the if there is a risk factor in the donor then the recipient to be chosen should be a stable recipient with a lower meld score and uh, this d meld score i will talk about later uh, in the coming slides so this is the second uh, part one which uh, graphs which confer a higher risk of uh, infection transmission to the recipient here we see that uh, the donor viral infections uh, hepatitis b and hepatitis uh, c these are commonly encountered and with the availability of effective medical therapy most of these patients can be managed with uh, Uh, direct acting antivirals in case of hepatitis b or uh, effective antiviral prophylaxis for hepatitis b with or without immunoglobulin so i'm not going to go into details of these but these are also donors that uh, uh, whose organs can be utilized in uh, as in certain conditions so briefly i will also share the experience our experience with these egg donors Uh, this was done as part of a thesis by one of our post graduates and published in 2016 so in that study we uh, evaluated 84 donors who uh, over a two year period our oldest donor at that time was 70 years and about a quarter of our donors were over 60 years of age we used hormone replacement therapy in all donors as i pointed out earlier all patients we uh, we kept the cold ischemia time below 8 hours in 96% of the patients and if you see this Uh, number it was 4.4 hours in patients who had uh, no poor function and 5.08 in the initial poor function group the maximum cold ischemia time was 11 hours in uh, an organ which was offered to us from outside of the city there was no primary non function and the mortality overall mortality was uh, in hospital mortality was 7.1% 15.5% uh, recipients developed initial poor function and on a multivariate analysis the donor ph uh, which uh, is a marker of metabolic acidosis which is again a surrogate marker for poor donor maintenance and macrosteatosis over 30% were significant risk factors for initial poor function 
it, hypernatremia was commonly present but in all the patients hypernatremia was corrected to 155 uh, less than 155 milliequivalents before retrieval other factors like donor age icu stay inotropes liver function test reversible cardiac arrest etc did not have a significant bearing on the outcome of these patients so what is uh, apparent from this study is that poor donor maintenance and increased fat content is one of the aspects uh, it, it predicted the risk of poor outcome and this could be optimized by balancing out other factors like maintaining the cold ischemia time low and giving hormone replacement therapy in all potential donors now it is not only the donors who uh, or the organ quality uh, that uh, basically uh, contributes to patient survival uh, recipient uh, factors and uh, both of them put together the donor and recipient matching is another factor that gives rise to uh, that can determine the outcome now how do we allocate these organs is there are different policies patient based policies are one which could be uh, either first come first serve which is usually done in smaller institutes with less waiting lists or uh, low uh, organ donor uh, frequency of organ donation the most commonly used is the sickest first or the urgency principle where meld score or meld like scores or modifications of them are uh, used there are other utility based principles which look at individual survival benefit what would be the survival without undergoing the transplant and what would be the survival gained by undergoing the liver transplant and that is used to make a decision uh, a model donor based policies again the donor risk is something that we have spoken about um, then combined donor recipient systems use a combination of these two to come out with sickest first with prognosis for example score of liver donor or sole criteria survival outcomes following liver transplant or soft criteria balance of risk score or bar score demeld is basically where the donor age is multiplied with the meld and if there are threshold values for example if the demeld is more than 1600 then uh, it is associated with a significant uh, negative predictive outcome for graft and patient survival and uh, the graft would not be allocated to that patient so this what has been seen in different studies this there is a lot of variation between centers and that is why there is no single scoring system that is uh, widely used different centers and different regions according to their uh, uh, patient profile donor profile and uh, experience have modified uh, these uh, to suit their requirements however what has been seen is selection to of recipients for extended criteria donors to compensate for higher risks to show comparable outcomes without an increase in complications um however when these high risk the organs are used for low meld uh, patients then the outcomes are inferior thus making it counter intuitive so one of the solutions that is proposed is mitigation of graft injury using extra corporeal graft perfusion in our setup donor uh, organs are not uh, predictable they may come out with uh, differing frequencies and uh, we follow a meld sodium system or the sickest patient first for allocation if the patient sickest patient is not given an organ there is no saying when the next organ is going to come and the waitlist mortality would go up so what we followed in our and uh, center and what is also uh, uh, followed in many centers across the world is that the first organ should be given to the sickest patient on the waiting list as they may not be uh, uh, waiting for a next or, uh, available or they may not survive to receive the next organ so this is especially relevant in uh, areas or regions where the donation rate is low now this is a chart which summarizes the various systems that are existing uh, these are the donor variables the donor risk index x, which i which we have discussed briefly these are the recipient variables the meld or the meld uh, like scores uh, which have been proposed uh, and these are scores that use combined donor and recipient uh, values to reach a uh, decision as to whether uh, the donor recipient will benefit from that donated organ or not now this is also undergone an evolution over time in the early days of first transplant there were no clear rules and usually uh, a donor recipient uh, matching would be on a first come first served principle 
now since the evolution of melt this then evolved to uh, basically sickest patient first um, uh, again but there were initially concerns about uh, post transplant outcomes and therefore this led to further uh, evolution into donor recipient matching using the different scores that we alluded to and the future is going to be uh, uh more com- uh, using p- the ability to use more variables from the donor and the recipient and possibly the use of artificial intelligence to put all these together into a matrix weight them and then give us an answer as to who would be the best recipient for a given donor organ so coming to the last part of my talk uh we are going to talk about um, organ preservation a uh, brief history is important uh, organ preservation basically started to mitigate the potentially harmful effects of hypoxia and to allow for organs to be transported from the time of harvesting to implantation cooling was an intuitive method to slow down the metabolism and it was found that for every 10 degrees drop in temperature metabolism essentially halved Kahn Roy Kahn was the first who studied uh, surface cooling of and vascular flush of kidneys with heparinized blood and he found that a vascular flush was better than surface cooling alone but uh, the blood uh, led to problems and uh, caused vascular stasis in grafts so there was a need for a better or a synthetic uh, organ preservation solution for ease of manufacturing uh, and supply storage and sterilization so the first initial solution collins were uh, designed an organ preservation solution in 1969 and this was uh, mimicking an intracellular electrolyte balance and allowed storage for about one day and this became popular and then remained the mainstay for about two decades uh, flush cooling and ice storage which is called a static cold storage is still the most widely used uh, technique of storing organs and uh, when they started it allowed for multi organ retrieval where all the uh, donor could be flushed with the preservative solution and then all the organs could be retrieved on block and separated out on the back table it is interesting to note that hypothermic machine perfusion also developed concurrently with static cold storage but then at that time it lost out on logistics because of logistic reasons reliability and high cost now there is again a growing interest in dynamic perfusion which is driven by changing donor patterns and donor distribution the need to optimize and use extended criteria donors to meet the increasing demand for grafts now briefly i'll cover why this is important uh, pathos uh, cell ischemia is detrimental to cells with aerobic metabolism and it results in failure of uh, homeostatic mechanisms because of uh, interconnected uh, uh, reactions that are essential for maintaining cell viability cooling does suppress the metabolic rate but if prolonged beyond the time it leads to depletion of atp with uh, glycolysis and lactate production this leads to failure of transmembrane ion pumps influx of sodium chloride and attendant water which results in loss of membrane potential and cell swelling and this results in mitochondrial damage uh, release of cytochromes and uh, initiating apoptosis chain reaction now kupfer cells or resident uh, liver macrophages uh, form an important role uh, in this the ischemia reperfusion injury is actually a sterile inflammation which is mediated by the kupfer cells and involves reactive oxygen species sequestration of leukocytes and platelets and release of inflammatory mediators now kupfer cell activation itself is mediated by toll like receptors and these are triggered by damage associated molecular patterns which could be fragments of chromatin from the mitochondria uh, from the dna from the nucleus which are released from ischemic injured cells now kupfer cells uh, play a dual role they intensify ischemia reperfusion injury in early reperfusion but later they also aid in healing and repair now this is an interesting diag- uh, diagram because the glycocalyx or endothelial glycocalyx is ubiquitously present on all uh, in all blood vessels and an intact glycocalyx is essential for maintenance of normal vascular permeability and tone normal response to shear stress and nitric oxide production normal leukocyte trafficking and uh, leukocyte coagulation and in ischemia reperfusion you can see that 
this glycocalyx is disrupted the glycocalyx fragments act as damps and they increase vascular permeability result in interstitial edema uh, they uh, increase leukocyte adhesion and activation impaired coagulation platelet activation and aggregation so this summarizes the role of endothelium in this ischemic uh, ischemia reperfusion response so organ uh, preservative solutions aim to mitigate these processes leading to cell death they counteract the water and electrolyte movement across the cell membrane preventing swelling they contain buffers which control the ph they contain free radical oxygen uh, free radical scavengers and energy pre precursors so what whatever i explained in the last three slides the role of organ preservative solution is to negate and mitigate the responses of uh, to ischemia and reperfusion so early organ preservative solutions like the collin solution was based on intracellular iron balance now this has undergone some refinements with increase in glucose content and removal of magnesium yeah, now it is uh, c2 uh, collin solution uw solution was uh, uh, basically uh, uh, designed by belzer and uh, this is still considered the gold standard for uh, uh, um, static or cold storage um, solution the difference between that and um, collin solution is that they added a colloid uh, hydroxy ethyl starch uh, xanthine oxidase inhibitor allopurinol lactobionate and glutathione which act as free radical scavengers and adenosine which acts as an atp preserve precursor now uh, i'm just listing out the most important solutions that are there in clinical use today igl1 is again based on uh, uh, uw solution but the ionic balance is closer to the extracellular ratios and it uh, it uh, has a less viscous colloid um, polyethylene glycol in place of hydroxyethyl starch htk or custodiol is another commonly used the advantage of htk is low viscosity histidine and mannitol are used as impermeants tryptophan as a free radical scavenger and ketoglutarate as nutrient precursor now there hasn't been much change in the composition of ops over the last decade but which shows that uh, th this is essentially as far as we can get in terms of static cold storage or organ preservation solution but there is work going on uh, preventing mitochondrial damage and uh, uh, promoting uh, repair however what is new and exciting now is dynamic perfusion techniques now there are several but i will for want of time i'll just focus on the two main uh, perfusion techniques one the first is hypothermic machine perfusion or, or with with or without oxygenation now hypothermic perfusion is basically at 0 to 12 degrees why 12 degrees because 12 degrees is the cutoff for energy dependent reaction of uh, several mitochondrial enzymes now hypothermia reduces tissue metabolism which we all know about and the perfusion provides metabolic substrates constantly and washes off metabolic waste so hypothermic perfusion has the potential to hypothermic oxygenation when it is added to perfusion has the potential to restore mitochondrial redox activity and the energy status of the cells in and uh, the it is also considered safe because in case of machine failure all that happens is we revert back to standard or static cold storage conditions but assessment of liver function in real time is not possible which brings us to this other exciting technique normothermic machine perfusion normothermia referring to 35 to 38 degrees celsius the difference here is there is complete avoidance of ischemia and hypothermia so this is not essentially a storage kind uh, the aim is not storage it replicates normal metabolism providing oxygen and essential substrates initial studies have uh, shown a reduction in graft injury allowing for longer preservation times no advantage in graft or patient survival was shown in these initial studies but subsequent studies uh, show you uh, picked up rejected livers and then after subjecting them to a duration of no normothermic machine perfusion showed that they could be uh, used with comparable survival to standard grafts now it also provides an opportunity to evaluate the viability of cells it allows extended preservation on, of uh, times of organs and what is most exciting is that it can allow for repair of damaged organs through pharmacological immunological and genetic intervention and these are uh, many of these potential uh, benefits are 
yet to be uh, yet to come into clinical use so to summarize use of extended criteria donors uh, is something that is inevitable there are very few standard criteria even in our own experience extended criteria donors are increasing and it is uh, in also inevitable to expand the donor pool to meet the rising demand for liver allografts and to lower our waitlist mortality now with improvements in donor optimization organ preservation and surgical techniques use of these extended criteria donors is possible with acceptable morbidity and mortality and with increasing experience and innovative techniques what was considered off limits uh, today can become mainstream in days to come so it is very difficult to be dogmatic about it but till that time comes since the risk is borne by the recipients onus is on the transplant community to balance the risk versus benefit of uh, this uh, procedure thank you very much for your attention and uh, uh, i am happy to take uh, questions Uh, thank you dr anand uh, it was a very comprehensive talk on as you said a rather dry topic now um uh, if if we can take the questions at the end uh, and we have a uh, uh, prof as well in the audience so and, you know we can get expert comments from him um uh, and uh, if uh, yogesh sort of a comprehensive discussion thank you. Yes. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Um, am I audible to all of you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, many thanks for uh, Ashwin and Dr. Radhakrishnan for uh, this opportunity. Um, I would like to introduce myself. I myself uh, and Dr. Yogesh. I am uh, one of the surgeons, newly joined Prof. Rela's team. Uh, from um, I was working with him in Kings and now joined here, um, and uh, I would be talking about organ retrieval, organ steps, and other things. So uh, the outline of my talk will be uh, I'll be talking about my experience of the organ retrieval, about operative technique which we call Kings technique. Um, then we perform the D uh, operations in a particular way. Uh, which i will be talking about um lastly um about uh, organ preservation but i think most of the talk is uh, covered by dr uh, ramamurthy already and uh, i will be briefly talking about indian experience and uh, what are the pitfalls which should avoid during this open so just to give you an overview um this uh, um organ retrieval in uk is very organized uh, being monitored and uh, carried out by the national organ retrieval services and as you can see the number of uh, um organ donations are um, around 1500 every year uh, this year also they reached around 1580 uh there are around seven abdominal teams and there are three uh, cardiothoracic teams yeah among seven seven abdominal teams the most busy teams are uh, kings uh, birmingham uh, leeds and uh, cambridge followed by other uh, smaller centers uh, so how the donor retrieval is uh, is carried out uh, basically in, in uk there is a confirmed at least in uh, kings there was a fixed uh, retrieval team where, where there will be two surgeons there can be one observer uh in addition to that and uh, there will be one scrub nurse perfusionist uh so the important thing is uh, we are like a representatives for the transplant centers in the local hospitals uh we should always mostly have a respect for the donor patient and family there should be close communication with the donor coordinators and the implanting surgeons and collaboration between the teams because abdominal team retrieves liver pancreas uh, kidneys and sometimes small bowels um, in uh, in our team basically a pediatric small bowel um, that is a multi organ retrieval uh, so the so the collaboration is very important between all the teams including cardiothoracic team and the pancreas surgeons and the parents um, also there 
we will be taking a local anesthetist uh, from the donor hospital and uh, theater staff which will be organizing in terms of the um, in terms of the uh, uh, various uh, logistics in the theater so prior to starting the retrieval surgery we should confirm the identity of the donor in uk it is onus uh, onus is on the lead surgeon to identify the brain death test uh, make that it is all in the order uh, it has been signed properly by two uh, senior consultants the um, emergency unit the, there should be a family consent uh, there can be a consent for research uh, which should be confirmed if it is not we uh, not say that we are taking organs for the research uh, blood group should be confirmed and then there should be a good communication because uh, there is a staff nurse organization uh, or smart who is uh, leading with the uh, basic donor and the recipient center communication so that's a donor coordinator so you should be very much uh talking and uh, communicating with the donor coordinator and assistant theater staff and other retrieval teams so what are the standard the retrieval methods retrieval methods are one is the standard retrieval method which is a dgd retrieval method the next one is a um, rapid technique which is again a, uh, very similar to a dcd retrieval non heart beating donation and uh, m block when the, you are taking the liver and the small bowel along with the Uh, as an end block uh, for the liver and small bowel multivisceral transplant so in this talk i will be talking about standard retrieval and uh, rapid technique and the dcd retrieval so to start with um, we always start with the uh, painting draping as we do in a normal uh, standard surgery the operation starts with the noting down of the uh knife to skin because that is one of the criteria to measure the uh warm shim time or the uh donor warm shim time so you open the thoracic and abdominal cavity full length midline incision uh once uh, you have opened the uh, skin subcutaneous um, you access the sternal notch just below the notch as uh, the abdominal notch there is a transverse vein running which you should be careful of and try to avoid and you create a space between the sternal notch and the anterior fascia of the neck and at the same time you create a space between the lower border of the sternum uh, between the diaphragm and then we pass the moenian and uh, uh, with the wiggly saw we will open the sternum generally and uh, after opening the sternum this is how the refractors are placed uh, we will open the pericardium also this will stabilize the heart a little bit when we open the pericardium and uh, the refraction is given uh, an utmost importance in this after opening and laparotomy and the uh, sternotomy uh, we will uh, look at any abnormalities or any tumors or we will uh, do a proper laparotomy run through the small bowel see if there is any untoward uh, malignancies which uh, will preclude the organ donation so uh, first we will do that we will have a initial inspection of the liver and the abdominal organs then where when we uh, this this is a king's technique so it's maybe a different from from the many other centers which uh, which might uh, uh, be doing the same operation so what uh, we start with the uh, dividing the left triangular ligament and accessing the falciform um, uh, accessing the uh, gastrohepatic ligament for the left accessory artery if the left accessory artery is present then we will be very careful not to uh, put any stretch on the artery and then that will change the decision whether where to cross whether in the abdominally or in the chest uh, so that should be the first step the next step is uh, we will feel for the presence of the right accessory artery uh, on the right side of the porta hepatis 
Uh, we don't generally mobilize the right lobe at this stage. I'll come to the reason for it. Uh, then we start with the porta hepatis uh, dissection. I can all see that uh, it will be a superficial way going to the um, first part of the duodenum and the pylorus. So we'll divide that. We will uh, divide the right gastric artery. Uh, and after that, we will localize uh, the gastroduodenal artery. So uh, uh, the decision to uh, preserve or um, divide the gastroduodenal artery uh, will be, we will pass a, a field if the uh, gastroduodenal artery is the only artery which is preserved, which is supplying to the liver. Then we would be. Um, we will be dividing that, but if there is a, we will be preserving the gastrointestinal artery. If there is any doubt of the supply, blood supply of the liver. Second, if there is a pancreas is so we will be. Uh, if you are in a doubt, then it's uh, just preserve it uh, for the time being in the long term. So the next step will be to go around the bile duct and uh, divide the bile duct. And uh, once you divide the bile duct, you will make sure that there is uh, no uh, right accessory artery. Uh, at this stage, you will uh, identify the right accessory artery after you uh, uh, have gone around and dissected and dissected around the um, CBD. After that, uh, uh, on the we move to the lateral part of the uh, or the superior border of the pancreas and try to locate the um, uh, splenic artery. And uh, once we have located the splenic artery, we will go around it with the tie. We will not tie the splenic artery. Uh, again, all this is considering that uh, there is a absence of the left gastric or a left accessory artery. Once we have, uh, uh, we have made sure that there is no left accessory, uh, we will proceed with all these steps. The next step will be a cockerization maneuver. Uh, maneuver. That cockerization maneuver is uh, is the very standardized one where you mobilize the C uh, uh, of the duodenum and you mobilize it up to the left renal vein. Once you have located the left renal vein, the next step we identify is the superior border of the left renal vein and the superior border of the right renal vein, and we will try to pass uh, a big sem. Uh, or a big uh, right angle, smooth right angle uh, around the left, around the IV, uh, lower border of the IVC, and put a tie around it. Uh, I will come to the reason for this also uh, when I uh, at the end of the operation. Uh, after that, the next step will be to go at the root of the mesentery and try to at the level of the sacral promontory. You see the bifurcation of the aorta. And you will uh, identify both iliac arteries dividing, and there is a um, aorta. So you we only divide only up to one or two centimeters uh, of uh, superficial tissue around the aorta at that time, and um, we'll pass the uh, two ligatures or two one zero ties around the aorta uh, like this. Uh, again, this. Will be uh, a variable step because uh, suppose you have uh, located that there is uh, one of the arteries or one of the renal polar arteries coming, uh, they can come at the at the position of this section. If you are a bit too higher on the, uh, before about the bifurcation, then in that case you should uh, isolate the both the iliacs and try to uh, have control from the iliac side. In, if there is a atheroma, there is a pseudoaneurysm of the aorta. In that case, also you can uh, go around the ilex and uh, make sure that you are ready for the penetration in that condition. The next step is uh, what we also, uh, with other centers, don't follow uh, as much as we do, but in Kings, we have been doing the uh, uh, perfusion of the liver, and we will uh, perfuse through our also. We will perfuse through the portal vein also. To access the portal vein, we will go to this point 
root of the mesocolon uh, around 3 cm below it it is very easy to locate the uh, superior mesenteric vein and when you locate the superior mesenteric vein there won't be any fat even for this particular picture there is a lot of fat uh, there won't be much of a fat in uh, in that position i can very easily without any blood loss you can dissect um, smv at this stage and we can pass two size again 10 around the smv now we we do this first because there is a chance that donor can become unstable at certain point uh, so if you have control over the aorta and over the smv then even in an emergency suppose donor goes into cardiac arrest you can very easily cannulate the both both these big uh, structures and achieve the good outcome um, again that is the first reason for this dissection the second reason for this dissection being a transplant surgeon uh, there can be many times where you may come across a situation where there is a portal vein thrombus and um, you even though you have tried to clear it the portal flow is not adequate if you are well versed to having this control over smv you can very well achieve um, a jump graft or a conduit from the smv to the portal vein again the dissection of the aorta in this particular state in this particular area is uh, is again very helpful when you have um, uh, some problem with the main artery and you are doing a transplant and uh, suddenly the artery dissects and uh, you don't have and then you have to contemplate doing a conduit aortic conduit this is the area where you will dissect for the aortic conduit and uh, this makes you ready for uh, that uh, impending um, problems the next step is uh, so this is just to show that uh, the level of the smv where we are uh, encircling the next step is identify the top end of the aorta which is the dissection of the supraciliac aorta so your assistant's uh, index finger will do a job here and it will reflect the it will reflect the esophagus more to the left side and you with your left hand you are reflecting the left lobe of the liver the soft tissue which you see in this area will be a uh, crust of the diaphragm so the crust of the diaphragm you can open very well with the right hand angle and your assistant can uh, use the diaphragm to open it once and then uh, once the, the muscle fiber circuit it is uh, the aorta is very uh, easily seen at that stage once you have seen and dissected the anterior part of the aorta to go around the aorta with the right angle is is very easy and uh, should not be a problem uh, and then you should uh, uh, pass a uh, umbilical tape uh, around the aorta uh, we we use umbilical tape because at this stage don't uh, uh, sometimes using a 10 tie at this uh, in this area the aorta can get crushed and uh, it can break so because the rest of the aorta is is uh, very much uh, fixed uh, uh, to the retro uh, retroperitoneum at this stage so it is very important that uh, you use the soft uh, uh, umbilical tape to encircle the aorta on the top side if there is a presence of accessory hepatic artery then you can't do this dissection i will uh, try and not do this this decision to reserve the left accessory hepatic artery if the left accessory hepatic artery is very much on the lower side and i get a window i will try and go around the uh, supraciliac aorta but if not i will not take this chance of dissecting this artery in that case i will go around in the thoracic aorta so the if the cardiothoracic team is not there the easiest way to locate this aorta uh, in the thorax is uh, to follow the left phrenic ligament once you get hold of the phrenic ligament you can just use your scissors to uh, cut and the lower end of the cardio phrenic ligament will be the aorta again one thing is this aorta will be very much uh, 
uh, here to the uh, to the uh, particular column, and you should and uh, esophagus will be about. So you should always be very careful that you are going around the aorta and not uh, around the esophagus, because uh, many times uh, with the starting of the retrievals. Uh, we have seen now uh, learning surgeons uh, clamping the esophagus rather than out. The best thing is to feel for the pulse. You use your uh, thumb and the middle finger and you go around the uh, and uh, you uh, feel the pulse at this stage. So, to summarize, uh, basically, we will mobilize the left lobe of the liver. I like the left or right accessory hepatic artery. You just really identify the identify and divide the GDA. Encircle the splenic artery, intrahepatic IVC, lower aorta, supraciliac aorta, and a superior mesenteric vein. When you have a cardiac team, it is very important for you to have a very polite and uh, discussion with them because they will be the deciding uh, factor. Whether to cross clamp and what time to cross clamp based on their logistics. Once they have, uh, they are happy and they have, uh, uh, they have scrubbed in. Uh, many times the cardiac team will scrub in after you have done your dissection. In that case, if they are, they are coming in later, we should allow them to inspect the heart, do their test, uh, pulse oximeters and everything. But you should remain scrubbed and uh, you should be around. Uh, there should be very good communication. You should always discuss with the cardiac team where you want to cross clamp. Are they happy to cross clamp in the chest? If they are not happy, uh, again, will they be clamping the supra diaphragmatic IVC or will they, uh, what level they will IVC? This is the area of the IVC which is uh, quite uh, uh, under discussion uh, for this. Uh, uh, with the cardiac team. Uh, so you should always, what I do normally is I will always put uh, uh, a medium swab around the area of the SN, uh, supradiaphragmatic IVC above the liver so that we will get the length uh, which is right for the implantation. Uh, most important to the cardiac surgeon is your friend until he shows disregard for the liver. Then he is not your friend and then you should uh, you should uh, take charge in that situation. This also applies for the pancreatic and the renal surgeons. So the last steps of the, how will the, so this is all warm phase. How will the warm phase end? The warm phase uh, basically ends with the cannulation. Um, so before you start with the cannulation, the preparation is the key. You should always make sure that there is a person standing or perfusionist or a person standing at the uh, uh, foot end with the IV stand and with the uh, various uh, uh, solutions ready. And now using the various preservative solutions, uh, Dr. Namosi has uh, gone through it. So what we used in uh, Kings normally is uh, either HTK or Marshall solution. Uh, through the aorta and uh, University of Wisconsin that is UW solution through the SMB portal vein. When uh, so we have used uh, UW if there is a pancreas retrieval and if there is a child less than uh, 40 kilos. Uh, the normal dose of the hip is a 300 international units per kilogram. Uh, this one uh, trick I always tell about uh, our cannula. So I always put the cannula below the transverse bar of my uh, abdominal retractor because many times with the uh, rushing, uh, this can get pulled. If this gets pulled, to put it again will be a big challenge and the organ can be um, at risk if your uh, cannulation is not perfect. So to have this preparation ready, I will always put the cannula under the retractor. So this is the position of the cannulas. So one cannula goes into the SMV and one cannula goes into the aorta. Now, before you are plating, you have to have cardiothoracic team and they should be ready with their cannulation 
at the so both the team should do cannulation at the same time because imagine if you are trying the uh, distal aorta there is a sudden increase in the peripheral vascular resistance and heart can go into arrhythmia and uh, this will obviously not be appreciated um, so once you have confirmed with them then we try the distal end of the aorta near bifurcation and then we you use your uh, index and the thumb pin fingers pinch the aorta by pinching the aorta you make sure that there is no blood coming out and then you can cut it below once you have cut you keep on holding and then you with your right hand you can insert the cannula inside once you have inserted the cannula you have to have control so you have to hold the cannula in the aorta because uh, in the dvd retrieval the heart is still pumping there is a lot of pressure in the aorta and your cannula will be thrown out if you just uh, relax on that um in kings we have made sure that the assistant uh, is are trained to tie the uh, the top end of the vasculature uh, around this cannula because uh, the left hand of this main surgeon uh, lead surgeon is in is is uh, is there and i used my other hand to hold the cannula at that time uh to position just to make sure that the cannula doesn't slip out so once the assistant secures the cannula with my right hand i will check whether the cannula is, is is in secure position if it is not in the secure position i'll ask the assistant to hold the cannula in the position and i will fix it like a drain uh so i'll go around and uh, fix it like a drain so that it it uh, gets secured in the aorta if there is a uh, bleeding from the posterior side of the clamp then i will always uh, small artery or muscular fissures there with this uh, there should not be much of a bleeding there uh, the next step will be uh, to cannulate the smv and portal vein to cannulate smv again you tie the distal end cut anterior wall we generally put a mosquito onto the anterior wall and then insert the cannula make sure there are no bulges uh, this cannula should uh, the, make sure you are checking the position of the cannula in the in the hilum and it should not go much deeper into either of the right or left uh, portal vein uh, or it should not be too low that your perfusion all your perfusion fluid is going into the splenic uh, circulation also next step comes the cross clamp examination so the examination is basically you have to be ready so this is where the local theater team comes into play and you have your communication with them that you will be uh, putting a lot of fluids including around 5 liters of blood will come out and plus all the perfusion fluid is come out so they should have two suppers ready the there should be a good coordination with the cardiac team about the cross clamp if they are happy to cross clamp in the chest uh, if the cardiac team is there i will generally have a control on the supraciliac aorta uh, because sometimes with their uh, cross clamp uh, they might be giving less importance to the to um, abdominal cross clamp so i basically have control over the over the abdominal side then we will divide the supra diaphragmatic ivc uh, near to the uh, right atrium uh, if the thoracic team is not there if they, if it, they are there then obviously they will be uh, making that cut and obviously you will examine the patient and at the same time you will start the fluids once you have started the fluid uh, there is a there is a quite a bit of discussion as in how much uh, perfusion fluid should go through the aorta um, generally in case we have a upper limit of 3 to 4 liters uh, through aorta and 1 liter through uh, portal vein uh, so the next step will be uh, just to make sure about the important steps about the pancreas retrieval so the pancreas retrieval uh, again the only variation in the pancreas retrieval as compared to the normal retrieval is that you you will be inserting the the portal in directly so the pancreas team generally requires around 10 mm or 1 cm of the uh, portal vein just up Uh, from the top, upper border of the pancreas uh, so once you have uh, given that then you can 
again go around the portal when at that stage and insert the cannula there and your cannula will be directly then once you have uh, started with the perfusion you start to cool down the organs you will put the ice uh, all around the abdominal cavity around the kidneys in the lesser sac around the liver uh, and then you will start with the you will cut the gallbladder fundus and uh, you will uh, start with the gallbladder flush flush uh, once the gallbladder flush is started uh, you also make sure at the same time that there is a flow of urine fluid is good the liver is getting uh, equally perfused and not perfused on one side or not any particular area of the liver is not very uh, less perfused um, remember that you have tied the distal uh, cbd at this stage so you will open this tie and also uh, uh, the cbd with the gw um, or a cold saline um, after this stage um, i will generally go around the lower border of the uh, lower border of the ivc and i will cut the uh, the left renal vein separately and the ivc use the tie uh, this tie helps me to have the position of the lower ivc um, because if you don't have this uh, tie what generally happens is with your scissor turn up uh, turn cordially you can go and uh, have a very little amount of uh, ivc when you are uh, in the that is the intrahepatic ivc and in the cold phase only we will do this this dissection of the right uh, uh, and we, we will uh, dissect the uh, we will generally use the scissors to dissect the uh, uh, right triangular ligament and at the in this stage the assistant should be very much careful not to give more traction uh, so generally and as a lead surgeon i will only control this traction as much as possible once you have done all these steps um, the ne next step will be to cut the portal vein uh, just above the cannula once you have cut the portal vein uh, depending on whether the pancreas is there or not and Uh, the cannula tip of the cannula you will turn the tip of the cap the assistant will pull the tip of the cannula and you can see the posterior wall of the portal vein again it is important to have a good length of the portal vein for the for the liver side if the pancreas is not there um, so we will stop the vision and we will cut the portal vein as much as possible uh, towards the confluence between the smv and the uh, splenic vein uh, after that there will be all the dissection will be uh, based on the um, upper border of the pancreas trying not to go clo too close to the pancreas uh, once the three or liters of the um, preservative solution has gone we will tie the uh, splenic artery we will tie the left gastric artery given that there is no left accessory artery and if there is a right accessory hepatic artery at this stage it will be easy to dissect the left accessory artery and see whether the artery traverses the head of the pancreas or it is going uh, posterior to the head of the pancreas around 70% of the time it will go posterior to the head of the pancreas and you can very well preserve the pancreas and at the same time uh, you can uh, uh, with the for the liver surgeons you can have confluence of the uh, splenic uh, confluence of the smv sna and the uh, celiac both from the same patch same aortic patch uh the only one variation here is that if there is a left accessory artery present then i will go on to the um, lesser curvature of the stomach and dissect all the tissue on to the uh, curvature of the stomach rather than pushing it uh, towards the uh, towards the uh, this thing um rather than going towards the artery i'll go around the lesser uh, sac uh, the next step is uh, again identifying the celiac uh, trunk and uh, dissection until the all done so here we will stop the perfusion and divide the supraceliac aorta uh, this is a 
uh, way to have a patch, one patch onto the select uh, for the SMA and the select axis. Again, on the bench, you will perfuse the uh, liver with the 600 ml of uh, UW and I3 with the 100 ml of UW. We'll flush the CBD again and uh, the liver will be packed standardly with the three sterile bags. Uh, there will be, uh, so after liver, the next organ will be pancreas and the uh, kidneys and then uh, vessels and uh, spleen for tissue typing. Uh, so that will conclude the procedure. Important thing is not to have any uh, foreign bodies in the abdominal cavity. So all the, from the abdominal cavity have a water exposure with mono nylon sutures and uh, completion of the, again, the, this is very much uh, uh, source of the problems in, in the UK filling these forms. Just gonna brief, briefly touch about the DCD retrieval. Uh, so all DCD retrievals are uh, controlled DCD retrievals and uh, so the number of DCD retrievals are going up exponentially in the UK. Last year was around 634. Uh, so the basic, uh, uh, basic uh, setting of the DCD is that uh, when you are going to a DCD retrieval, the first thing you'll ask is whether there is a cough reflex or gag reflex present or not. Uh, secondly, whether there is a... Uh, secondly, we will make sure that uh, people in the care, uh, along with the anesthetist, along with all the teams, know what is going to happen. So the, uh, after us, slowly there will be a five-minute standoff. After that, patient will be shifted onto the table, and you have a rapid access. What do you mean by rapid access? Means uh, for the abdominal incision, opening of the chest, placing of the retractors, accessing out, cannulation, cross clamp, all should be under within five minutes. Obviously, patient is not bleeding in this stage, so you can go with the knife and then the just, just the scissors. And although it seems a lot, but uh, it, when you get used to it, it is not a bit of a problem. Uh, I'll talk about organ preservation, but I think Dr. Ramamurthy has already covered this part, so I will be skipping this. Just briefly touch about the Indian experience. Uh, mostly, I come across that obviously there is no detail here at all the DVDs. And uh, all communication is on WhatsApp and whatever, uh, depending on, based on all the donor management, based on uh, all the variant anatomy. So everything, of everything on the surgeon. Uh, but I should remember that there is, uh, the important thing is the safety of the organs. Now, what are the pitfalls? Just gonna briefly say about this. Uh, the, in the thorax, if there is by surgery you should be aware of there uh, that there can be wires in the sternum the important thing is access the aorta and access the uh, smb and ready for the cannulation because many times the heart can be stuck to the to the sternum um, we will always make sure that there is a bone cutters in the set if we are going for such people thinking uh, if donor becomes unstable it's then it then becomes easy you just convert DVD to DCD. Based, if there is atheroma in the abdominal aorta, then, as I said earlier, you can go to the iliac arteries. Uh, rarely, uh, you can cannulate through the supraciliac aorta, but uh, that is very, very rare when the aneurysm is involving both the iliac region. Uh, for the inexperienced team, you should uh, plan before and make sure everybody understands uh, what. Uh, what and what are the steps and you know what you expect from everyone abnormal and vascular anatomy i have already explained and uh, i've already explained about the kidney anatomy thank you uh, thank you yogesh for the very comprehensive talk you've actually gone step by step on each of this i i hope the juniors are able to sort of visualize the whole picture uh, uh, before I ask uh, 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 Dr. Anand Ramurthy, you know, a few questions and may, maybe get Prof's uh, opinion as well, I would like Abdul. Is Abdul there? Uh, uh, Abdul and 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 Dr. Ilango Zetu, uh, is he also here? Uh, Dr. Ilango and yeah, and, and Dr. Srinivas Reddy as well. 
Add, add, uh, so um, now uh, what we heard from uh, Dr. Yogesh was the UK experience. I just wanted to know, is there anything, uh, you know, uh, different which you would do across the pond, um, you know, in um, uh, America and Pittsburgh or uh, other centers, uh, you know, with regards to retrieval? Uh, Dr. Ilango and then Abdul, if Abdul is there as well. No, pretty much... Um, um, pretty much the same. Pittsburgh, we were all taught the um, rapid procurement technique. That was uh, that was pretty much the common one. Um, yeah. And I think the sequence of uh, dissection is slightly different. And uh, during the tra training, I have not done much of warm dissection. The, the rule was that don't do any warm dissections at all in Pittsburgh. So they were very keen that we learned the super rapid technique from Pittsburgh. So that's how we were taught. taught. I mean, I, these are the only differences I could make out uh, from from the presentation that was given. Yeah, um, yeah, it's something uh, we have also been taught here uh, in Prof's team that as soon as possible, uh, you should have. Uh, uh, control around the IOTA and and the SMB or the IMB so that you know you're always uh, quite ready to start perfusion. Um, uh, if I I may ask Dr. Anand and Ilango and Yogesh as well. Uh, and, uh, I can't see Abdul here. Maybe uh, because uh, I, I, I wanted here. his opinion as a pancreas transplant surgeon. Can you hear me? So, oh, yeah, Abdul, I can hear you. Yeah. So uh, uh, if uh, if you have uh, uh, pancreas retrieval as well. What would you not want a, 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 a liver retrieval surgeon to do? I mean, you know, when, and uh, if uh, if you don't want them to do a few things, what would those be? Uh, okay. Abdul, you can take it, and then Ilango can go in turns, and then Dr. Sure. Okay. I think I mean uh, just with respect to the pancreas alone. See, I think in uh, Cambridge we uh, used to we used to always do the retrieval in the same step. So. We never used to dissect the SMB. It's always portal vein where the cannulation happens. The reason is because wherever you uh, cannulate, cannulate the portal vein, that could be area where you actually, uh, I mean, when you start the cold perfusion, you have to, you have to divide the portal vein in the, in the pancreas retrieval because you have to drain the pancreas. So we always sort of keep it, keep it, keep it ready. Uh, so that, that's a standard uh, step. And we do that even if there is no pancreas, we still do the same thing. So one thing we don't want uh, the, uh, liver, liver surgeon to do is that we don't want them to leave too small uh, uh, portal vein because I think Yogi said one centimeter I think probably I'll leave at least about 15, 15 millimeter at least 1.5 centimeter at least because what happens is that I think you'll have to trim it down a bit more so you'll actually lose the length so the shorter it is the more difficult the pancreas implantation becomes um, with the risk of injuring and then if there is a, a accessory right hepatic artery or replaced right hepatic artery. I think it's very important that the liver retrieval surgeon speaks to the pancreas surgeons about, about the complexities. And I think in UK, the decision is mostly uh, uh, goes towards the favor of the liver, liver surgeon, liver, liver uh, team, because obviously uh, liver being sort of a life-saving organ that takes priority. So, I mean, like what he said, I mean, if the, if the right artery goes through the head of the pancreas, then obviously you, you don't want to sort of uh, you can, I mean, you can cut the right hepatic artery above, right accessory hepatic artery above the above the duodenum, and then and then and then you, you you're obviously going to do that and then reconstruct it later on. But but sometimes uh, sometimes some some surgeons might not want to do that and give liver the priority. So that's something I think that's uh, that's, that's a discussion we can have for a long period. Long period. Uh, Dr. Ilango, um, anything you would like to add to that um, with regards to pancreas mainly? He's muted. Uh, you, um, we can't hear you, Dr. Ilango. You need to unmute yourself first. Sorry. So, sorry. Uh, the only thing that uh, we were taught different when we have pancreas procurement is looping the SMA at the uh, aortic takeoff. That was the only thing. And we were very, very careful to get a proper toolkit when we have a pancreas procurement. So uh, when we procure the toolkit, we make sure that there is no traction injury and the crotch is never injured. So that is something which we were taught. That Those are the two things um, um, in the, when we have the pancreas procurement. 
Dr. Anand, that Apollo, would you do any any steps which are different or which you would find more useful, you know, in your experience to maybe skip a few steps or something like that? Yeah, uh, is uh, is there anything you would like to add to what uh, Yogesh has said from his no, experience? No, not that I can think of. We used to follow the Pittsburgh technique as well, and uh, so when the pancreas comes, then just uh, like what uh, 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 was told earlier and what Dr. Ilango added, nothing uh, out of the uh, in to add to that. Um, uh, do we have uh, Srinivas Reddy, uh, Dr. Reddy, are you there? Because um, what usually happens is when we go on our donor runs, uh, any time of the night, we either call Dr. Srinivas Reddy or Prof, you know, for the final uh, question, should we take or should we not take? So, which is why I thought maybe it might be useful to have him as well. Now, uh, if, uh, I, I don't if, think he's there. I don't think Srinivas is there. Oh, he's not there? Okay, sir. Um, uh, uh, if I may ask you, Dr. Anand, you know, when, with regards to this uh, extended uh, criteria donors, uh, we, we know about uh, hepatitis core antibody, but then if they are HBS uh, AG, antigen positive, or you know, in regards to HCV, uh, when would you take and when would you not? When would you say yes and when would you not? See, and, our yeah, in Indian scenario, especially because now we know that, you know, we hardly have any organs coming about. True. I mean, uh, to be frank, uh, we haven't accepted uh, any H hepatitis B or hepatitis C organ till date in my experience here. And uh, I mean, what uh, literature says that hepatitis B surface antigen positive can be given to hepatitis B surface antigen positive or core antibody positive um, recipients. And hepatitis C, uh, you would ensure that the donor is less than 50 years of age you would do a biopsy uh, for both B and C. And uh, if the bi biopsy shows anything more than peripotal fibrosis, then you would not accept that donor for uh, uh, transplantation. So, I mean, these are the only uh, two things. Then you would try to, of course, mitigate and make sure that the re our remaining risk factors are not there. So in our setting, there are a lot more logistic problems. I mean, basic problems, very basic problems that we face. And um, um, again, so when we, every additional negative factor that comes up just adds to the, um, you know, complexity of uh, decision-making as well as impacts on the outcome. I mean, even if a uh, graft were to have primary non-function, for instance, there is no saying when you're going to get the next graft. Uh, so, you know, you may, there is a strong likelihood that you might lose the patient. So in every way, plus the economics of the situation are extremely challenging because most of the patients in our setup are self-paying. So we have to be uh, very judicious in the use of these organs so that uh, it does not, uh, while, um, you know, aiming to utilize maximum number of organs possible, we do not uh, subject the recipient to... Uh, risk that may potentially, you know, put him in uh, uh, like trouble that we cannot get ourselves out of. Okay. Uh, what about you, Dr. Ilango? Uh, and, uh, yeah, if you have a Hep B or a Hep C uh, donor, and then um, say uh, you have a low risk HCC, uh, you know, oh, low so, um, so well. the UPMC Veterans Administration accepted quite a bit of uh, Hep C positive donors. They were mostly young donors. They were drug addicts uh, who died of drug overdose, and they were quite commonly used. And uh, since the males were mostly more than twenty, um, we we used to accept most of these organs. They were very good actually, the Hep C organs. But I have not used Hep C here in India. The Hep B core was Co-positives, we have accepted, I think in uh, Muir, there are quite few patients with heavy core positive donors. Um, but we have not uh, had the experience of transplanting organs taken from those with uh, surface antigen positive uh, donors. I have not had any experience in that. But um, apart from that, hep C positive, I, I, uh, earlier the, uh, the age was a key factor and uh, more than 50 years uh, donors were not accepted, but I think those those things are evolving, and I would like to hear Prof's uh, 
opinion on that as well. Yeah, I'm not sure if Prof is online. If he's online. yeah, I'm there. I'm there. Oh, oh Prof, thank you, Prof. Uh, um, no. I just want to <laughs> your opinion as well. And uh, yeah, yeah, if it is, I mean, uh, we have experience with regards to LDLT where we find a donor is incidentally core antibody positive, Hep B core antibody positive, and then we go ahead and do it. But then, uh, if it's uh, Hep B core and uh, surface antigen. Or Hep T positive, then would you still offer the organ to a recipient, Prof? In a uh, see, I I think um, in the past, um, I mean, I still remember the days when when we never did core antibody tests. Core antibody tests were in the early days done, but um, they were done later on. Only surface antigen and HCV antibody was done in most of the donors in the early days in the UK. Um, and I remember having one patient I transplanted who came back with uh, uh, fibrosing cholestatic hepatitis. Um, so we tested all the, all the staff who were involved in the operation for the HBV. And then later on found that the donor was core antibody positive. It was only well after that that, um, in fact, core antibody was included in, um, in, the, in the donor tests to be done before you decide on a retrieval. Um, <clears throat> now, if you ask me in the in the order of preference in today's term, in today's term uh, with the availability of antivirals, really um, DAAs, um, as Ilango said, the we, we are talking about really non-serotic uh, patients with a completely healthy liver uh, who are either core antibody positive, surface antigen positive, or um, uh, HCV antibody positive. So. Um, as Anand said, you do a biopsy and they have to be completely non-serotic and should not have uh, anything more than periportal, mild periportal fibrosis or grade one fibrosis. That's, that's where you're choosing. So there is absolutely no reason why these organs would work well. I mean, they, if they're young donors, they are much, they will work better than fatty livers. They'll work, you know, better than 20% or 30% stereotypic liver. So there is absolutely no worry about immediate function. So the, the, the worry is what the long-term worries are with these. Um, and with HCV, in the olden days, we thought a patient who is HCV positive receiving uh, a non-serotic, normal HCV positive from a HCV positive donors was not thought a big deal because everybody who was HCV positive really reinfected the graft um, before the days of uh, antiviral treatment. So the, the, it, it was a routine to manage HCV recurrence uh, and in the early post-operative period, getting confused between HCV recurrence and graft dysfunction. All this was a was a routine problem with the HCV patient. So we didn't think much about using HCV positive uh, graphs in the older days. But now the situation is even better because you can actually treat them post-transplant as well with um, HCV, uh, with, with, with uh, the direct acting, acting drugs. So today's world, I don't think you should never turn down um, a HCV positive um, donor, uh, provided the liver is normal and healthy. Um, and you should never turn down a core antibody positive donor. Um, but surface antigen positive donor is, 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 is still an issue because you can still have um, a reinfection of the graft, reactivation of the virus because the viral particles are always there. Um, and that is uh, so even for the core antibody positive, but in a much, much smaller scale. <laughs> Prof, and I, if I may ask something which is more, uh, uh, you know, pertinent to the present day, uh, uh, if you have a COVID positive, would you say yes to the donor? Would you say no to the donor? Dr. Anand as well, if you can take a question. Um, I'm, I don't know. I think um, um, it still is if, I mean, if provided people are willing to anesthetize a COVID positive, it depends on... Um, when they have died and what they have died of. See, this is, this is one question that I've always wanted to, I mean, I think I've discussed it with you. Yes. Um, people who die of COVID uh, die almost three to four weeks after the infection. So they don't die in the viral phase. They, do, they die well after the inflammatory phase is set in. Um, 
uh, if in today's world, um, if you get a COVID infection, uh, at least in the in the UK, uh, two weeks later, you got to go back to work. You can't stay at home. So you can actually meet your colleagues, go back to work, and all of that can happen um, if you have recovered from COVID. So the general feeling is after three weeks, you're not infective. And unless patients arrive late to hospital and die of an acute phase of hypoxia, uh, most of the patients um, uh, who are COVID positive, uh, I mean, I don't know, you're talking about a situation where somebody's uh, dying of a road traffic accident who's testing COVID positive. Yeah, uh, incidentally COVID positive. It's, it's, it's yeah, but then you don't, you don't know how long they've had the illness for, so you don't know how infected they are. Um, so the issues all uh, relate to the healthcare workers. But my understanding is there is no transmission of um, the infection through blood anyway. Um, but I, I, I think, see, I think it's very hypothetical. I think you're just teasing people by asking this question, I think. Um, because if you actually look at the literature, in, in the, it is possible to have the viral particles in the liver as well. Uh, and in organs as well. So I, I don't know the answer to that question. But if you ask me if somebody's died three weeks or four weeks after the COVID infection, and if they have to donate their liver, I don't think it's, a, it's an issue. Uh, and I think we, we, are, we are actually really facing this because we have had um, donors who come for the workup and then they are found to be positive. And now we are telling them we will do their transplants three weeks later. We'll, we'll accept them as donors three weeks later after their illness. And, and the recommendation now is also three weeks after um, the, their illness, uh, they could be um, donors, they can be considered donors. So potentially there is then no viral particles in the liver. And the question will arise if the recipient has been not COVID positive and if the donor turned COVID positive, how long do you wait for? All of these questions are there. I think currently they accept three weeks as a reasonable time for them to have cleared the virus. Okay, is that, thank you. Is and, that okay? Uh, Does somebody have a strong view about it? This is a new subject, actually. Uh, Anand, uh, 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 Prof should have the last word. Me. I mean, there are more questions than answers, and I am more worried if you ask me about the, uh, you know, organ donation and declaration and uh, that process being shut down, where we have many patients who are. Uh, not COVID positive, but uh, we are simply not uh, proceeding with organ donation due to bureaucratic reasons. I think that is something that is more concerning to me because, uh, you know, not being able to do transplants when you can and should be doing is more important than what should you be doing in a question like that. I think Prof has elaborated it quite well. And I, I, I confess that I have more questions than answers. Theoretically, yes, situations would be there where it could be possible. But uh, in the absence of adequate information as to uh, not only about the viral particles, but also about it being a circulatory or a thrombotic uh, kind of a disorder, what kind of uh, effects would be uh, there uh, is something that I don't have data or experience on. So I cannot comment any further on that. Uh, you have a comment to make, Dr. Ilungo? Um I have a question to Prof regarding the uh, general procurement. Uh, um, as, a, as a senior surgeon who has been teaching a lot of transplant trainees over the years, how would you actually assess the, um, the uh, surgery that was done at the procurement operation when you're not there in sight? And how would you assess them, Prof, by looking at the organ retrieved? Is there any way you yeah, have... I, I think... Um... See, that you, can only, that you can only assess uh, by, by looking at the appearance of the organ. You can only assess whether it's been well perfused or not. Um, if it is poorly perfused um, or if the perfusion is patchy, part of it can also be actually how sick the patient has been. There. So it's very difficult to assess. Uh, you, can't, you can't tell. You can only tell by how good the, the function of the organ is actually. Uh, if, if somebody is retrieving a very straightforward... Um, um, organ and then you put it in and they've got um, bad reperfusion injury and uh, the graft function is not good. Uh, once or twice it's okay but if it's persistently uh, a problem then it's probably not been very well retrieved. 
but that can also be that the donor's management has not been well, um, has not been very good. But consistently, if you find a problem with uh, early graft dysfunction or very high enzymes, unexpectedly where the donor has been absolutely stable, where the donor liver function tests have been normal. Otherwise, it's very difficult to say. Uh, if you're talking about injuries, obviously, you know, if you, if you get an injury, the, the most common, I, I talk about the most common injury that people make is a little tear on the inferior aspect of the liver. I always tell people you've got to divide it because when people are pulling on organs without dividing the, the strands or the, or the additions uh, inferiorly, and if the graft is actually slightly fatty, you get a lot of uh, capsular injuries. Um, so if people are actually uh, damaging the surface of the liver to get subcapsular hematomas and capsular injuries, that's another way of knowing that uh, the surgeon has not been a very good surgeon. Uh, but it's very difficult to tell. Um, but you will only hear, hear from people who are assisting them how good they are. Um, you always have to have a reasonably experienced surgeon going with uh, the junior surgeons to help them through it. They can even sit in the coffee room and let them operate. But um, that's how it needs to be taken. I, I don't think um, somebody who's not done much should venture themselves because uh, it does have implications for the recipient. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Prof. And, uh, if, uh, if I may ask um, both uh, Dr. Ilango and Dr. Anand first and then maybe get expert comments from Prof. Now, it's not uncommon when we go on these donor runs that that you know um, the the uh, uh, owner abdomen has been opened up by by the in house team they have seen the liver they have said no to the liver they, so 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 you know uh, yeah, it has gone onto the common pool or the rota and then you are like the second team or maybe even the third team what makes you say yes or no uh, dr anand if you can take it first dr ilango you can take it next and i would like prof's comments because yeah, at the end of the day, you know, when we go on a donor run, we either call Dr. Srinivas Reddy or Prof to, to take a call and they say yes or no. Um, so, uh, if I'm taking this first, then yeah. uh, what we have observed is that uh, usually if the organ is pristine and uh, good, there is very little reason to pass it over. So there is usually a combination of, uh, you know, uh, factors. Uh, it could be, you know, hemodynamic instability, for instance, or an arrest wave, uh, uh, or, you know, impaired um, high, anything else, you know, what we talked about in the high risk factors. So then we have to balance it to find out, you know, in the absence of uh, organ, uh, if you're not using normothermic uh, perfusion or uh, hope or any of those perfusion techniques, then we really have to evaluate, you know, who is there on the waiting list and, you know, whether we can take it, whether it's logistically possible. For example, if the call were in the evening from uh, Madurai or Coimbatore or some such area, then I would tend to say no, because logistically it would uh, be a nightmare and then it would add to the cold ischemia time as well. Um, but uh, sometimes we have seen, especially from the smaller hospitals that uh, they tend to say no when they do not have a huge uh, recipient waiting list and then they do not have a suitable recipient uh, at the time of the thing. And especially if uh, we go through the donor factors, we will be able to make that out. And uh, it's a relatively well-preserved younger donor with all other parameters within reasonable limits then we do tend to uh, we or more if it is possible then we definitely go and take a look at the organ that is one key thing and we have found that in cases where the organ is usable we um, uh, bring it here then we flush it in the uh, we do a biopsy and then if it is all right then we take it for our recipient but uh, sometimes we are uh, they do tend to clamp because you know the cardiac team was uh, in a rush and they kind of uh, uh, were forced to cross clamp. And in those cases, again, we would be very reluctant to accept the organ because of the logistics and the cold ischemia time going uh, very high. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Ilango. From, yeah. from my side, I think uh, we are a very small team uh, of three surgeons. So we are very, very uh, strained on logistics. 
um, and um, apart from Dr. Anand Ramuthi's comments, I don't actually have much to add. But um, what we look at is uh, the fit. So I need to have the recipient seen very well and, um, and know the body habitus before I go and accept the organ. Here, one of the most common, uh, I mean, before I left Pittsburgh, one of the last lessons I was taught is never accept a large for size craft. Here, uh, we find that a little, I, I found it a little hard to accept that uh, large for size crafts were procured and brought to the uh, recipient. And um, we've had technical difficulties on that part. Um, so I, I go and see the size and the fit. And if possible, Pari had a very good protocol uh, of looking at the biopsies himself. And I learned a lot from him on that. Now we have a very standardized protocol to look at the fat, the fibrosis, the necrosis um, uh, in those uh, liver biopsies. And when we, was, when, when we are happy with all those fit, uh, the donor maintenance and the acceptance suitability for the recipient and the acceptable biopsy, we, we have no difficulty in taking that. But um, after going through all these tests, we have not done a transplant by uh, taking an organ that has been refused by others so far. Um, and we uh, usually see it's, it's sometime late in the night and then, you know, we need to give the... Uh, the uh, body back to the to the family as well so you know there are time constraints uh, involved uh, in in this so i'm 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 not sure how often we can actually get a biopsy get it transferred to our unit back probably our, um, our our setup was good so we were able to get it so we are we can consider ourselves lucky yeah. um prof uh, 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 if i gave you a call in the middle of the night when would you say yes to the organ when would you say no to it and 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 it's a third order. I, I think um, uh, in the in the Indian setting, it's very difficult to find that somebody's turned down an organ if they are a reasonable size program, like Anand said. Unless they have no recipient, supposing there is an AB organ and um, they have got only one recipient or something. Um, if if the if the story is very straightforward, for example, and you don't understand why the 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 center is turning the organ down. Uh, then I would go. I, I just look at the story as though it is being presented to me for the first time. Uh, and if I feel that it, it sounds a reasonable organ, then I would want to go because uh, there are many, many reasons that we don't know why um, um, the, the local team wants to turn down. And um, uh, so you don't actually have a good picture. So, I mean, I'm not saying it's a lack of trust in the system, but um, it's worth trying. And everything depends on uh, the, the risk that the team wants to take. Um, I'm, I'm sure the Apollo team, I, I, from my experience, um, take a much, um, uh, take a, I think they, they are much more daring than even I am sometimes, I think. Um, and, and I'm sure they, they, they have very good results that way. Uh, so if the Apollo team says no, probably I, would, I wouldn't actually take the organ. Um, so you learn with time. See, in the UK, I've always found that we have taken organs that others have turned down. Kings have always taken the organ others have turned down. But the reason why people turn down an organ is very different from the reason why people turn down organs here. In the UK, people will turn down organs usually on a Sunday or on a festival day. Uh, we'll end up doing many more transplants during Christmas time because surgeons will find excuses to turn. To, there, is, there is no incentive and, you know, uh, the UK system is like that, whereas here it's much harder to find that an organ is usable when a local team is turning it down, other than if they don't have a recipient. Um, actually, Ilungo told an important point, actually, which is not actually very well um, uh, publicized, is the large for size graphs. Actually, large for size graphs in adults is not a good idea at all. Um, if you if you look at, you, you need to understand why a liver is large. Usually a liver is large because it's fatty. And when, or the recipient is very like a young female, you know. Um, and if, you want, if you're trying to fit uh, um, a, a 70 kilogram or an 80 kilogram person's liver into a 50 kilogram recipient, and if it doesn't fit in, 
you get a huge amount of problem actually it doesn't sit well it causes a lot of necrosis and also in the early days when when we we actually accepted any size we used to do reduced livers now nobody does reduced livers i don't think the indications for reduced livers has completely disappeared um for example if you've got a 20% fatty liver or a 30% fatty liver which is larger for the recipient you can't actually split split that liver i mean they won't work well so you have to really reduce the uh, the peripheral aspects of really the right lobe or um, w- actually without interfering with the hilum without doing hilar dissection you can stake the parenchyma off but you will find that when you are actually reducing fatty livers the outcome is very poor so that point that um, choosing the size is very important I, s- smaller livers are absolutely fine for adults but large livers are not fine and you will find that very fatty livers are quite often turned down because they are large for size unless you have a big recipient pool and you've got large recipients um large fatty livers are not ideal and you can't really turn them down so it, it depends really it depends on how big your waiting list is how many patients are desperately waiting and how you can use those organs that you go for but i have found that in india after coming to india i found that we have used less and less organs turned down by other centers compared to when i was in the uk right prof thank you um the uh, other question which i would like to put to prof is uh, especially since he has a special interest in split liver transplantation from the kings now uh, uh, would you apply the same criteria to split the liver in india as you would apply in the uk or or or, uh, or would you modify the criteria in india no 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 i think we would apply the same criteria actually um the only thing is in the early days when i came maybe 10 years ago uh, the graft dysfunction rate was slightly higher when the organ was retrieved from um other centers or when you went out to trichy or coimbatore the the graft dysfunction rate was a little a higher for the kind of organ i used to accept um but now i think it's not uh, th- that big an issue and if you certainly had an in house um organ um i think if they fit into the criteria for splitting every organ should be split um i'm actually i feel that um uh, in india or in in tamil nadu we are not splitting enough uh, because um, not everyone has uh, pediatric liver transplants or pediatric patients waiting on their waiting list and therefore uh, most centers don't have an incentive to split um, and neither are they actually offering the left splitting and offering the left lateral segment to other units who got pediatric recipients i think we need to work on this um, um, I, i think it has to come from the government we have tried actually to force uh, the government to um ask centers to split organs if they are splitable but um, i don't think uh, we have got much there um i think we need to sit down together as a group and uh, come to some conclusion about whenever organs are splitable if there are children also waiting for a suitable graft that um, the centers which are doing the adult transplants um help uh, or at least uh, come forward to split and offer the left lateral segment to a pediatric uh, patient in another unit and um, thank you for that prof um uh, the uh, other question which uh, and we, we have actually spoken about at length uh, in the past which i would like to ask both uh, all uh, yogesh anand and ilango is with regards to normothermic perfusion yogesh had extensive experience in the uk now um, we started with the uh, cold uh, preservation and now we seem to be going away from it in parts uh, it uh, it did come sporadically in india but it's no longer available So, where do you see the future of organ preservation itself? And Yogesh, would you like to take it, and then Dr. Anand can tell us the Indian experience, both Ilangu and Anand. Can go with it. Yeah, I think um, when I was there in Kings, we did uh, put uh, quite a lot of uh, livers. I think around twenty on the machine, and uh, we're part of the multi-center uh, uh, trial which is going on. But I personally felt that. Um, Uh, depending on uh, the logistics i think in uk when there is uh, there are centers where there is only single organ is coming to the center and you know they want to logistically uh, have a team ready like you know liver is coming at 3 o'clock in the morning and then the uh, the, the team can come at 3 o'clock in the morning and transplant that liver yes why not 
secondly if the liver is marginal and they are not sure whether to use the liver then they have used some criteria like uh, lactate and you know on the machine how much is the ac um, and how much how does the liver look on the machine um, so that criteria also can be used to use a marginal organ um, but i personally feel that um, the what machine does that uh, you have a um, reperfusion on the machine rather than on the patient because you are perfusing the liver the liver to cold perfusion then again you perfuse it on the machine and then immediately you are transplanting that liver into the uh, you are starting the implantation so this is what we we did and we we saw that the patients the recipients were very stable during the reperfusion they didn't have that much of a hemodynamic instability uh, or anything like that when they were trans uh, machine machine so i think uh, three things uh, marginal organs logistics and um, uh, you know having if the patient is unstable cardiac patient you know where you don't want much of a uh, cardiothoracic instability i think in those scenarios maybe machine is very uh, useful i think uh, and uh, uh, are the steps of organ retrieval uh, any different when you when you plan to put the organ on a machine no i think uh, we use the two types one is that when we retrieve the organ so we have retrieved the organ at the time of retrieval we have used the cold perfusion and immediately after that we have put the machine in the donor center onto the onto the machine and then the liver is carried Uh, to, uh, in the ambulance with the machine, and then the machine is perfusing while there is a transfer for the liver as well. I think that is a kind of a, a very ideal. The second is when the 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 all the centers they have the machine in in house. Then the organ is coming from the cold perfusion, so there is already cold issue at time of four or five hours. And after that, the machine is come the the organ is coming in. Then you are putting the organ on the machine. and they have they have said that the minimum time should be at least 4 hours uh, to have some uh, judgement on the whether to use the organ or not to use the organ so i think that bit is uh, is is not very useful but it is useful when you have like two livers and you want to finish one transplant and then uh, to have another liver you want to have some time then in that scenario i think that will work very well it's not often we see that in india with regards to ddlp i wish we do in the future uh, now anand would you like to uh, give your experience with regards to organ perfusion in the indian scenario and why do you think it's not uh, sort of uh, taken off um, yeah uh, i mean it's uh, personally i do not have a an experience of uh, organ perfusion especially normothermic uh we've tried hypothermic on one occasion more as a demo than uh, on an actual need to use basis uh one of the main reasons why uh it is difficult for it to work here is the cost uh added cost see we are already talking about uh, using them because there is no additional survival uh, patient or graft in uh, a good quality liver so you're talking about extended criteria donors and when you are going to put them on a normothermic perfusion the added cost was uh, around 6 to 8 lakhs uh, which was supposed to be there and then the machine had to be there had to be advance notice so the logistics were a problem the machine had to be brought from wherever it was stationed and with hypothermic uh, oxygenated perfusion again it's around in the range of 3 to 4 lakhs so i mean that was one of the main reasons why i did and the second thing is when the recipients are paying for most of the transplants are paid for here and the moment there is a even when in the when we used to talk about core antibody positive donors and uh, you know stuff like that there used to be a fair amount of you know reluctance or resistance from the recipients who said no no we'll wait for a better quality organ and that kind of stuff so in this kind of a system to offer that at a uh, increased cost a uh, so called uh, you know marginal organ or this thing is is th- th- these are practical and logistic difficulties that we have, that we will face i mean what uh, dr puri said once we have machines stationed at every center and it's substantial it's over a crore for a 
or no, not more, more than that, for a machine to be stationed uh, in every hospital and for the hospital to see the, you know, uh, pra- uh, the practicality or the, you know, uh, uh, return on investment from that. And then we would be able to, you know, do some of the things that we are talking about in theory and what they are doing in the Western scenario. So these are the problems that I see in our country at present. Um, uh, I had no, uh, Ilango, yeah, sure, thank you. I had no experience in normal thermic perfusion or in hypothermic perfusion in the liver. What was uh, the uh, uh, what was a good experience for me was that we used to put kidneys on pumps um, in in US pretty quite often, and we found that most of these uh, kidneys function very well. Uh, the longest uh, cold ischemic time I I had transplanted was about 48, nearing 48 hours. And most of the SLKs we did while the kidney was on the pump. The pump parameters provided a good uh, good guide to the outcome in kidney transplantation. So I was, uh, at that time, most of the European people were trained on the machine and US did not have any such machines in clinical practice. So uh, apart from the kidney experience, I don't have an actual experience in the liver but I'm very much thrilled to hear all the reports from coming from the Swiss HPD group, as well as from Birmingham uh, about its use in DCD reverse. And uh, I'm very happy to have the machine here. It's the cost constraint which is keeping us from using those machines right now. Uh, Abdul, um, uh, any experience uh, from, from back at uh, time in Cambridge uh, with regards to the machine? Yeah, sure. I think so. I think in Cambridge, we used to put them on the organ ox. I think we had we had an indigenous uh, machine ourselves. I think uh, Professor Watson and uh, I think Peter yeah, and yeah, I think they, they, they were the sort of the first people sort of to publish on this in 2004, uh, which took about nearly 15, 16 years for the organ ox to come, come, come on board. I think, I mean, we had an indigenous machine to start with, but now I think recently for the last two years, we've started using more more organ ox. Um, I think the DCD rates have gone up by about 40 percentage with the with the increasing use of organoids. I think we we found that uh, uh, sort of we in Cambridge we did about sort of uh, uh, 40 40 of them, and we did uh, MRCP on them just like a protocol MRCP on them around around 12 months time and found only one one out of 40 patients had uh, any sort of uh, clinically not significant uh, ITBL so ischemic type B relation. So I think. I mean, it, uh, the recent data has been quite good for the normal thermic. I don't think hypothermic has got any hope. I feel, I think that's my personal opinion at the moment. Sure. And thank you. Prof, um, your expert comment. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of uh, normal thermic perfusion. I've seen the graphs and I've worked earlier, earlier on in the early patients, uh, the very early patients, actually. Weil has been working on that. Um, if I'll tell you something, um, I mean, all the points that um, Anand said are completely true. Um, we cannot spend another six lakhs or eight lakhs and put it on the patient's bill. Uh, it's not acceptable and patients are always willing to wait for better quality organs. But if you ask me if money is not the issue. Um, in fact, uh, we are now talking about extended criteria and seeing if the organ is working, we can do tests to see if the organ is working. Maybe that for that purposes, I think in any situation, even for the extra cost, it's worthwhile. But I feel that it will be worthwhile for all livers, unless it's absolutely young liver, where you're in-house retrieval and we are just going to transplant the liver, with, with the, which is going to have no difference in function at all. In all other instances, I think it does improve because now we are talking about a completely different way of really preservation, organ preservation. Anand said nothing has happened over the last 10 years in terms of preservative solution. I, that was a very important statement because we have not actually progressed very much in terms of organ preservation for the last 10 years. So what is coming new is actually the normal thermic perfusion. What we need to understand is whatever, even, <laughs> even what um, bringing an organ to your own center uh, traveling for three hours, four hours, and then putting them on a normal, normal thermic perfusion, I think is still a huge advantage. It is not a disadvantage. Whenever you cold preserve an organ, we need to understand you're shutting down the metabolism within the cells, but you never shut it down 
hundred percent. There is always some activity, maybe three to five percent activity going on within the cells. The cells are not dead cells, so that is why the longer so that what then then happens is you got the accumulation of metabolites, the accumulation of lactates within the cells uh, during this process because the cells get acidotic, and the longer the cold preservation the less the, the cells will tolerate because the activity keeps on going on. So it actually, cold preservation shuts down the cell, probably 95%, but not 100%. And therefore, when you're reperfusing these cells, you get a massive reperfusion injury. So your reperfusion syndrome is related to the longer the cold. That's why you can't uh, preserve an organ for a liver for more than 12 hours or 16 hours. Uh, if it is a very fatty liver, you can't preserve them for more than eight hours or so. So everything is related to the long cold preservation. So when you actually short cold preserve these things, and then you put them in the machine and then warm preserve them again, you wash out everything because it's an oxygenated warm preservation, actually. And therefore, when you, we, I've seen livers, elderly livers being reperfused after four after 14 hours, 18 hours, with absolutely no reperfusion injury. I think it is for the future. One day, I hope that the cost will not be that much when people start using them extensively. And I, I do believe that we need to move in that direction, even though actually in India, I've never used one, uh, even the, when the machine was here, uh, even though we were doing quite a number of um, disease, donor, um, disease donor organs, we never used it in India. But I'm still, is, I'm a great believer of normothermic perfusion. And I think it is here to stay. And uh, it, its application will become wider and wider. Uh, the cost is what is going to make it slow for us to take it on. But I think ultimately patients will accept it and the cost will be included or divided up between patients. And um, if good graph function can be achieved, imagine having a poor graph function and the patient stuck in ICU for two weeks the cost will be much more than six lakhs or eight lakhs. Um, and therefore, I think there will be an application for it in our country. And thank you, Prof. Thank you for that. Um, uh, I just have one last question. Uh, 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 we have been at it for about two hours now. So, um, uh, do, do you think there is a future for DCD in India? It is not legally permitted now. But do you think there is DCD in India? That's first question. Second, uh, when you go for a DBD retrieval and, and then the donor arrests on table, it technically becomes a DCD. So uh, are we allowed to take the dog? Uh, no, we have had uh, uh, such a scenario in the past and then, you know, we haven't taken the organ, of course. But then, you know, uh, how would we go about that? If Dr. Anand can take it first and then Prof can maybe... I, I, I would like to continue from the last one. I absolutely agree with Prof and it's very exciting. And I think one of the main areas where once the, you know, uh, we've had several discussions with several stakeholders in the past and uh, about DCD and uh, most of the people we've talked to are in favor of going ahead. And that would be one of the uh, a very important scenarios for uh, initial use of, you know, uh, normothermic uh, perfusion and that, that would really change and not having to go through the same, uh, you know, uh, curves of poor uh, function, graph function and complications that people have gone through. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, we've had this, I mean, arrests on table and, you know, being able to re revive during a DVD uh, does happen. And, you know, as Dr. Uh, as was pointed out in the retrieval video also uh, by Dr. Yogesh, we, can, we, we are prepared for those kind of scenarios. because but, uh, I if, I, if I may just rephrase that question, say uh, as, as the donor is being, is, is being transferred to the theater or, or you've just made an incision, you still haven't gone around the iota. And if you obviously have a sling the, uh, around the iota, then it's, it's quite straightforward. But then, you know... But Ashwin, are you saying that it's not legal? I think it is legal. It's not allowed. You can proceed. Allowed, no, According to NOTO, it is not. Uh... I didn't know that. See, come on. You can't, you can't certify death twice. If you have certified somebody to be dead, brain dead, mm. they are dead. 
whether their heart stops or the heart continues to beat you can't change the mode of uh, certification after they have been certified once how is it illegal they are yeah. still brain dead donors certified dead because they are brain dead and then they have a cardiac arrest they don't become dcd i mean yeah. technically they are dcd the the the, the type 4 but in terms of certification it makes absolutely no difference they don't have to be recertified after they have a cardiac arrest mm -hmm. their original certificate of uh, brain certification of brain death still should hold good i wasn't aware that it's not legal to go ahead uh, uh, it's not uh, uh, allowed in the note of profile mean, it's it's the only thing Oh, no, Ashwin. Oh. Can, can I just say yeah. something? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Ashwin, I think I think uh, there's nothing against uh, going ahead with the retrieval if the patient has a if the donor has a cardiac arrest during surgery. In fact, we've had a situation like that once in a global, and yeah. the uh, we 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 were planning to take the kidneys, but finally didn't happen. But as long as the the patient has the relatives have consented for donation and the patient has been certified brainstem dead before the retrieval procedure starts. irrespective of whether the patient has a cardiac arrest during your procedure or not it, it's irrelevant actually i don't think there's any rule to say that i mean to my knowledge there anything uh, to say that you cannot proceed with, re with retrievals at that time no uh, on uh, on table is uh, is different but then if you have a straight forward dcd it's not allowed is it yeah yeah straight dcd is still not legal in our country but if a person has been declared at brain stem death and then has a cardiac arrest in theater i think we can still proceed okay prof um, any last comments before we close the session uh, again we've been and uh, uh, no i i'm uh, yeah my my opinion about dcd for india is um, still i think um, is not that easy to really get it going in our country i know anand said we are having discussions about it um i'm still concerned about dcd in our country actually i think um, a uh, public uh, because people are still not donating extensively um, even after brain death um and even among uh, health professionals um, um there isn't a huge acceptance of brain death so that we have got a long way to go uh in in terms of uh, the disease donors um so for dcd i think we need to be a little bit more more mature in the system to to go into dcd because there is a risk that uh, the public will lose confidence in the in the system if we think about dcd quite i mean this is my personal view i think um even even in the uk in the beginning we have had we've had situations where somebody's been consented um for um uh, donation uh, as a dcd and then uh, they did not have an arrest after extubation and um, and there have been at least two situations where patients have gone home um i mean that sort of situation really um Uh, is is horrifying for relatives of patients who have consented for donation, but uh, the patient has actually come home. Um, so I I personally don't think um, we are quite ready yet. I think we need to do a huge amount of work on brain dead donors and improve the numbers uh, at least to you know five per million or something like that before we could venture into. We shouldn't venture into DCD because our um, um brain dead donors numbers are lower it should that shouldn't be the reason actually we venture into living donor because there are no um there are no no disease donors um, that is the way that the far east went and that's the way we have gone uh, in india but to talk about um dcds because we are not working hard on dbts is not a, not a good way sure prof thank you for that um i think we can close the session i would like to um uh, thank uh, dr anand and dr yogesh for their excellent talks dr mm -hmm. ilango abdul and, and and dr reddy as well of course and 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 prof is always there to give us expert comments and we can meet uh, uh friday for uh, another session uh, can you answer a question yes please go for it yeah uh, thank you my question would be to professor rela and uh, uh, that was an excellent talk regarding organ preservation in the uh, when the organ is coming from a dcd or dbd in living donors where we have a very sh short uh, cold ischemia time and a very short uh, warm ischemia time should we be using organ preservative solutions uh, when there is no much uh, uh, not much of a bench work and we are taking an out an organ 
flushing it and putting it should we be using organ preservative solutions in that case thank you yeah i, th I think that's quite a brave uh, brave question um i i i think there may be a possibility but um, you don't want damage to the organ if supposing um your warm ischemia is long or you have some difficulty um you can actually match up you you take a liver out to fuse it with cold cell line and then you can implant it i think um, that there is a real possibility in living donor in very straightforward situation um i don't think most people would um, take that risk really um uh because if something happens and if your if your warm ischemia is prolonged or if your uh, implantation is prolonged you don't want to take a risk but i think it's a good good question uh if you ask me in a very straightforward situation where you're timing the donor recipient and uh, the recipient surgeon is ready um i think a lot of kidney transplant surgeons do that way so they prepare the bed then put the clamps on and the and the kidney comes out they do the bench work quickly and then they put it in in the liver if um in the liver obviously if you've got to do some bench work you may have to preserve it because the bench work may take about um an hour or so if you are reconstructing the anterior sector and all of that but if you are going to if you are going to implant it immediately after taking the organ out um i think it's uh, it's quite possible to do there there may not be a need you can just flush it with cold saline and do it why have you got difficulty finding preservative solutions no no it was just a thought and it came into my mind uh, uh, keeping in view the yeah, practice yeah, that's in the kidney transplant pure cold saline itself is uh, a preservative to an extent um so you can you can actually flush it with saline uh, and if you can keep your cold ischemic time to less than 1 hour there is no reason why not you know it is possible to do but um, it it is you have to be an extremely experienced surgeon who will make no mistakes you take it in and you put it in and there, there is absolutely no issue with it i don't think any surgeon dares to do it yet thank you uh, sir there is another question uh, because you said regarding use of uh, grafts from core antibody positive patients what is your approach in those patients regarding hbv or the use of uh, hepatitis b immunoglobulins or do you only use entecavir or tenofovir and secondarily in uh, hcv uh, when do you start the treatment with the das post transplant and assuming was ready i want to answer that he'll give you a comprehensive answer seniors anyway we don't use um, anti we don't use um, uh, immunoglobulins anyway for um, um, for core antibody positive patients we just use um, antivirals on both situations you would use antivirals uh, for hcv positive uh, if you're putting it into hcv positive recipients you don't and you don't need to start treatment uh, for a while you can start after a month or two or uh, if you're finding that there is graft dysfunction uh, and if your um, hcv rna becomes positive you can actually start treating a bit later there is no hurry to start treat treatment immediately in the post transplant period srinivas do you want to say something are you there i'm i'm not sure he's uh, he's i think he's he comes and goes as he likes sir <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean that's that's what i would do uh, for hcv there is no need to start immediately uh, for uh, the hpv core antibody positive patients you would start them on um, um entecavir or tenofovir rather than um, immunoglobulin there is absolutely no indication for immunoglobulin for core antibody positive uh, donors and it's expensive Uh, absolutely prof i um, in uh, in fact if there's enough uh, uh, data to show that entecavir has 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 uh, in in the long term in the uh, in the in the recipient is equally effective as giving uh, immunoglobulins yeah, even in the presence of hpv dna um uh, so uh, uh, if you have no further questions then maybe we can close the session uh, pata sir uh, yeah uh what an exhaustive session i should say and it's a very thorough one and uh, you know it's so nice listening to prof anyway that's the reason why i keep 
awake so late. It's a wonderful session. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Ashwin. Thanks, uh, Professor Vila. And Thank you. Uh, pressure listening. I shall end the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.